Okay, so uh, we're going to get started. Um, welcome to this session uh, called Post Baccalaureate Support in Blended Learning Using Our Experiences as Recent Graduates to Contribute to Change in Higher Education. And this session will focus on um, post baccalaureate's mixed work experience and the opportunity to contribute to blended learning initiatives with a unique perspective on the undergraduate experience at their institutions. Post-BACs post discuss creating sustainable structures, working in grant-funded positions, and reflect on their different projects. Our panelists today are as follows. This is going to be our <coughs> um, Chris Guy was formerly a post -bac at Amherst College and now is a post-baccalaureate um, for blended learning um, at <laughs> Bay Path University. Um, Miriam Timber joins us from the five colleges language learning and technology program. And from Bryn Mawr College, we're joined by Elizabeth Riley and Esther Chang, both educational technologists, and Jen C. Mungia, the research assistant for blended learning. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Hi, all. Thank you for coming into our session today. Um, I'm going to start off with just a general. Uh, oh, actually. Do I have to use it? So, um, as you can see, it says ask a question at Google Slides, and then this has the code for it. And so, this is a new Google Slides feature where it's kind of like pull everywhere but built in. So if you have any questions throughout this um, discussion or um, presentation, just send the question there so that you don't forget, and then we'll go over them at the very end. Oh, oh this is me too. Sorry, I forgot. I forgot which So at Vermont College, we have an educational technology services team, and with, that is within the library and information technology services. So it's an integrated um, library in IT. And um, in August 2015, we moved from the provost office to the library, and that was a big shift for us and a big, um, I think, cultural change for our group because we weren't a group before that. We were just one academic technologist with some post facts and then we became an educational technology team within the library, and that um, office was 15 people, we moved to a department of 75 people, and I think through this transition, we were able to really collaborate more fully with um, the support of other people in the library, whether it's like librarians or people with special collections, like people who are already working with students and faculty, we can partner with them further, and so I think that was a really great move we already had built a lot of relationships with faculty by being in the provost office. So that was a really um, great mesh, and I think it was a, definitely a strategic partnership there. We didn't really work the seat incorrectly, but it's fine, we're working with it. Um, okay, so Chris and I, both are, both of our two different post -bac positions are housed at five colleges incorporated. I, some people are actually from five colleges in this room, but I will just briefly, will briefly explain it um, for those who are not so familiar. Um, five colleges is a consortium of five different, very different unique institutions. Um, there is Amherst College, Mount Holyoke, Smith, and Hampshire, which are small um, liberal arts colleges. Hampshire is more experimental, and Mount Holyoke and Smith are um, all women's colleges. And then there's the University of Massachusetts, uh, where I graduated from, which is obviously the, um, the state's premier research public institutions. Yeah, and so um, we often like to refer to Five Colleges Incorporated as a six-member institution, but basically Five Colleges Inc. is an organization um, where we both have been working at. Um, an organization that facilitates um, a variety of different ways, collaboration and interaction um, across the member institution campuses between faculty, staff, and students. Um, there are a number of resources or a number of avenues where this sort of takes place. Um, for example, there is um, a lot of resources and support around cross-campus registration um, to enable students to take classes at any of, the, any of our member institutions inter-campus transportation so they can get to and from each campus. Um, there are a number of certificate programs, um, certificate and academic programs where students could come out of their undergraduate experience with 
um, a certificate that they wouldn't otherwise be able to obtain. And um, you know, another example where our particular positions really come into play, um, the Blended Learning Initiative is one of the resources available to member institutions that um, the goal is more or less to help fac interested faculty um, put together blended methodologies and blended content and ideally roll them into what we call uh, blended pilot courses. And um, yeah, and so as the post-baccalaureate, um, we'll get into it a little bit more, but um, did, did a variety of <laughs> different things to support these courses um, as they were being put together and run. Um, and my position is, is similar to Chris's. I am the post for, the name has changed a little bit, the post for Language Learning and Technology. And I'm working on the Innovative Language Teaching Grant, which is virtually the same as the blended learning, except the courses need to be exclusively language courses. And they don't necessarily need to be blended, although some of them have, in fact, been this year. Um, so just a little background. We didn't actually say we were or like our schools or anything. I graduated from UMass in 2014. I studied Middle Eastern studies and Arabic. So I was interested in this position because it, um, as a language learner myself, I'm always trying to figure out ways to incorporate technology to better and more effectively learn different languages. And so I thought that this position um, really allowed me to experiment with these different types of, of um, uh, different pedagogies. And so within, like Chris's faculty member, language faculty apply for the, the grant and um, after a pretty extensive review process, upon acceptance, we work with them to create an actual new innovative collaborative language course on one of the five campuses.
all of these connections and or ability to make connections and facilitate different types of relationships in these different projects. So the first way, um, and I'll speak mostly to my experience, a little bit to Chris's, but I think I can generalize to everyone else, um, is that we already have pre-established networks at our schools. So the benefit of all of us having gone to the institutions um, within which we're still working has a lot of benefit. So for example, I studied Arabic at three of the five colleges in Western Mass, and I bounced around depending on where my professor was located. And as a result, I had, I had a solid base of language faculty already, as well as students um, who some of whom are much younger than me and are still there currently. Um, so that was that was really helpful in um, navigating that a little bit. I already had some connections, and these some of these faculty actually have been faculty members that I've worked with this year. So already, you know, we, we crossed that that border of getting to know each other pretty quickly. Um, also, with pre-established networks, we already, I mean, I know the camp, I know the layout of the university and the other schools pretty well. I know the physical layout of the campus, having gone to UMass and having taken classes at Amherst, Mount Holyoke, and Smith. Um, I unfortunately didn't take a class at Hampshire, but I, I did go to events. So overall, I have a, a pretty good sense of the layout. Not just the layout, though, we understand the politics of the different institutions, how UMass works as a public institution versus Amherst versus, you know, a single sex. Um, and so I think, have. A, a, a really big benefit, in, in my opinion, of having gone through these schools is that we come with this, this context and this background already, so we can jump right into it. And, um, the orientation process is a little bit less, I think. Um, although we will get into how being a student versus being a staff member at these institutions um, is quite different, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so another, another thing that we have is that we have a foot in each door, and I think that that's particularly unique with this type of post faculty recent grad position. On the one hand, we look, sound, sort of are very newly minted graduates, so we kind of still feel like students to most people, including at least myself, I don't know. <laughs> um, but we also do have staff responsibilities. We're located in offices with staff members, many of whom have been there for you know decades and um, are very experienced, and we have staff responsibilities and um, staff connections. So in that way, we are able to, to put a foot in each, in each side. I think, personally, what this has led to is being able to establish, um, very, first of all, very strong connections with students. Um, I unfortunately have only, have only been able to work informally with students in my position, but I'm located in the Five College Center for the Study of World Languages, and we have, I think, 150 students coming in and out of there. So informally, I've been able to use my um, recent graduate status to, to talk to students and engage their experiences with language learning, um, sometimes with technology, sometimes it relates explicitly to the things that I'm doing in my position formally, sometimes it's more um, informal connections with the information, but, but either way, I think being a recent graduate has a lot of benefit when it comes to establishing relationships with students at these institutions currently. Um, on the other side, I think this recent student status can, can provide perspective for faculty members. I think um, as a language learner myself, as I said, I think um, I have very immediate knowledge. I, I just spent last year in Morocco, so I can um, very quickly bring up what the experience is like learning the language, being thrown into an immersive environment with technology, without technology, and so very quickly can reference this experience, which I think has proven very valuable to faculty members. Um, not to say that you know if you haven't studied a language in 30 years, it's not equally as relevant, mm -hmm. but I think there is something to be said for that immediate knowledge. And regardless of whether it's language or whatever it is, I think we all bring that um, in our various fields because it was so, you know, two, one to two years out. Um, and also, I think the fact that we're not totally staff members, I mean, we are staff members, but I think, as I said, it is kind of a weird limbo. And actually, we'll discuss the challenges that come with that ambiguity, but I actually think there's a lot of, of benefit um, that we're not exactly just staff members, so we can kind of navigate certain politics, hierarchies, relationships in a, in a slightly different way than other faculty, um, and particularly staff might be able to, which I think can work towards our benefit for the overall success of the projects. And just as a final smaller point, um, I think in terms of outreach and building bridges, there's a lot that to be said for having a recent graduate on your team. Um, I think that given the nature of our work, and again, I'm speaking mostly to my experience, I think that I'm kind of a point person in a lot of ways. Um, some faculty members want me on their projects more than others, <coughs> and some people need more administrative help, so we can kind of bounce between all of these. 
um, and I can make connections with staff members, that faculty members might not want to, might not be able to, um, and then I can kind of connect the dots with them. As one example, I worked with a Smith IT <coughs> staff member. We experimented with a, a new robot technology that was just mentioned in one of the last sessions, actually. Very informal demoing and, and discussion of this project, playing with it. And then it come, um, you know, it, it turns out that one of the faculty members on one of the projects um, through our grant needed some type of technology to fill the gaps between a video conference class. And I, having just seen this robot in a different context with a staff member, was able to say, how about we, we try this in your class? And she might, this faculty member might not have known that this technology existed. For whatever reason, there, there's a gap of knowledge. Um, so I think that in, in that particular instance, I was able to combine my staff limbo student position to connect the dots with a faculty and staff member, which in turn overall, you know, benefits the overall success of each of these projects and um, grant as a whole. Um, so I'm going to back up for a second, just give you a little bit more information uh, about myself. Uh, my name is Chris Guy, and um, I am a recent graduate of Amherst College, which was one of the member institutions at five colleges. And um, I was an English major, and so I don't, you know, doesn't immediately jump to mind as having a strong, like, technical or technological background. But my uh, first real exposure to technology in an educational context really came from my uh, work that I did my senior year um, with digital storytelling, and it really, um, starting then and up until now, and through now, you know, till present day, um, has really made me curious about the different ways that technology can impact um, student learning and how it can really change the way that we're teaching students and, and what we're able to do with students. You know, I'm get up on my soapbox for a moment. I can, um, I sort of feel like education is this like democratizing force and I feel like technology, you know, I've seen examples where technology can sort of be this catalyst for, for that type of change to facilitate that kind of, um, that type of democratizing uh, uh, force. Um, but yeah, so I will jump into a little bit another aspect that I think we I'll spe be speaking mostly from my uh, my experiences as the post back the blended learning uh, initiative. But I think again we can generalize a lot um, of these experiences to sort of say um, to, to, to have some takeaways from our overall experiences as post backs and what it means to be a post back uh, in a blended in a blended learning context. Um, so I am in a room with other academic professionals, so I feel comfortable speaking exclusively in work-related cliches. So <laughs> for the moment, you'll see jack of all trades is, is one such phrase. Um, I, uh, a nickname that I had um, that I gave myself while I was, <laughs> while I was working <laughs> at my colleges was the Swiss Army Knife, you know, multi-purpose tool, doing a lot of different things. Um, and as you can see clearly from this uh, beautiful image, I wore many hats. Um, I can, I can, you know, put that, I'll put, I'll actually stop with the word related cliches, and that is all just like sort of a segue to um, talking about the versatility and the utility of the post back position, you know, so, um, you know, as Miriam touched on uh, briefly, and as we'll get into, uh, you know, a little bit later, um, there's a certain amount of ambiguity that comes with uh, being a post back uh, being this recent graduate, but also having student or having staff uh, responsibilities. Um, and I think from from this perspective, thinking about it as being the multi-purpose tool, being the, being the jack of all trades, um, it's really an advantage and something that's unique and very valuable, both for the person that is doing the work and also for the projects or the program that you're working with. Um, because it becomes this sort of Relationship where I'm able to, you know, as a postdoc, I'm able to leverage the experience um, and the back, you know, background and skills that I have to identify, help identify and um, fill in gaps in the project workflows that we're trying to support. Um, and I'll I'll get into uh, a more specific example of that uh, right now. Um, so last year, we um, at the Five College Blended Learning Initiative support one project that we were supporting was a, an advanced uh, Japanese language course. And initially, um, the faculty member was interested in working with um, video lectures. So she was interested in having student, uh, guest lectures, other faculty members produce um, produce videos that she would uh, then incorporate as blended as a blended component into her course. And um, 
my initial role with this project was really the tech support. Um, she was becoming, uh, she was very interested in having these uh, be in, in an interview format. So I was able to sit down with her and introduce the video camera to her and how different audio and, and the video settings would really work and have that you know baseline familiarity with the tool um, down so she would be able to go forth and do what she needed to do. Um, fast forward a little bit, um, later in the summer towards the beginning of the, of the fall semester, this course was going to launch in the spring, um, and I was able to be a part of the conversation um, with this faculty member who was, um, at this point, was transitioning away from this interview format and was having, inviting her guest lecturers to um, just record themselves, have their content um, on their computer screen and record it that way. And so, um, like with my team, and I was, I was part of the conversations where we were more or less able to have the faculty member um, push them in, in to ask and answer questions you know, about the content that we're creating, um, what it is that we're trying to do with it, so what's the actual shape that these videos are going to take, and um, what it is that you imagine the students doing with them. Um, and that was a really, that was a really interesting um, experience for me, just being able to, to sort of be on the other side of uh, that content creation uh, <coughs> part of the conversation. Um, so fast forward a little bit further, and we've started to get answers to those questions. You know, what we really want these videos to look like, how they're going to be used in the course, um, and we're starting to get to the point where we actually have a lot of content that's going to be coming in. There's a lot of moving. There are a lot of moving parts to this part to this project. Um, you know, and a lot of things that had to be kept track of. And so, um, for me, I was able to, again, be part of the conversation, um, helping this faculty member set up project workflows and deadlines to be staying in touch with the faculty that, uh, the faculty that were going to be giving these like, guest lectures and making sure that everything was on track, doing some QA on things, and making sure that everything was, you know, going, running smoothly because, again, this course was um, being run we're working on it in the fall and it's being in the spring. Um, and then uh, from the beginning, video editing, we're working with a lot of <laughs> multimedia. Um, and this is, uh, was from the beginning going to be a very important part of making this project actually run. Um, and initially the plan uh, for this course was to hire a student who was both proficient in the Japanese language and have multimedia experience, experience working with video editing platforms. Um, <laughs> For different reasons, uh, we had some trouble finding a student um, that met both of those needs. And at this point, we're getting later. We have content that's coming in, and we're getting to be, you know, we're we're almost getting to crunch time. We're getting we're we're getting uh, maybe a little bit antsy. And so I was able to um, sit down with the faculty member and our dedicated staff person who was working with this project, and sort of just throw the question out there: like, do you think it would help if I would jump in and sort of be the person to help edit these videos. Um, and that's more or less <laughs> that's more or less what had to happen. Um, it's you know it's interesting because I didn't have the language experience, the you know familiarity with the Japanese language. Um, but we were able to sort of bridge that gap for me um, by setting up a really close and really <coughs> constant communication with the faculty member. So you give me some instruction on what we're doing, um, and on what cuts need to be made, I'll take that, you know, and I'll show you what I've done. Does this work? Does this make sense? What needs to go? What needs to stay? And it wound up working out. It wound up working out pretty okay. And I, you know, I think the videos came out pretty, pretty all right. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I'll sort of say about this, um, about this whole having multiple roles within the post bank experience is just throughout this entire process, like this one instance. Uh, like shifting roles, being a collaborator was the, the constant. You know, this was a team effort. Um, you know, it wasn't me just like taking over. Obviously, it wasn't me like taking anything <laughs> over. But um, like that is something that was a constant throughout, and is something that I think, you know, looking a little bit ahead, looking a little bit ahead is something that I'm really uh, was really valuable, a really valuable learning experience for me. Um, learning how to work with people and yeah.
done, and then you guys have time to ask us questions, and it will be more interactive. Um, so now we're going to talk about the challenges, and I'm going to be really honest. Are you ready? Just kidding. <laughs> no, I will be honest. Okay, so I think first off, um, I think this position has been really, really great as an undergrad um, going to um, transition to um, a job after going to college for four years and not only dedicating myself to like studying and not really being able to um, kind of understand like oh, how do I do my laundry and things like that. <laughs> so I think it was a really great transition because of a lot of things that people have said like having pre-established networks and things like that. And I also think especially kind of what Jansu was saying, I definitely learned so much so many hard skills that I was able to combine with the soft skills that I learned in the liberal arts setting. I think that was really key as well, and also being able to think about both those things that I've learned technically in a critical way, and also um, be able to curate kind of technology to fit the needs that um, our students need as well. Um, so uh, one thing that was really difficult was the ambiguity of the so I think a lot of times hearing faculty, staff, and students walk down and say like, oh, didn't you graduate or have a good spring break or something, and we're like, we're still here, <laughs> sorry, don't get a break. And so those kinds of things were kind of small ways that are, I feel like my position was invalidated maybe, and just my um, maybe worth as a staff member on campus, especially feeling a lot of being able to finally I think transition from feeling like a student to feeling really strongly as a staff member and then um, understanding kind of what that means and feeling kind of invisible as a staff member versus a student, like knowing that there are different ways to get into buildings where you almost don't have to be seen. And I think that was really interesting <laughs> to feel like very much in the background in inner workings, but also appreciate my student experience more because I understand how much staff here work to support students in their own ways and like people don't even realize. And so I think that was really valuable. Um, and also I think it was hard because sometimes it was difficult to know what was my place in the conversation. If, especially when we were starting out, um, people didn't know who I was and they thought, who, who is this random person in this meeting? And we weren't really introduced and things like that. So I think that was also part of the challenge is kind of making a place for ourselves and making ourselves known as staff. And then I think also one thing that we talked about is this perception of accessibility to technology. So really <coughs> assuming that just because we were coming from a student and we were younger that we would know technology well. And I think sometimes that is really helpful. So I think um, having um, someone young go and teach a faculty member how to use technology, there's not as much kind of animosity because they assume that you know more because you're young. And so I think in some ways that was actually helpful, but it's also kind of a weird position because I think personally for me, coming from a culture that values like people who are kind of respect for people who are older than you, being able to be the one who is teaching them, it was hard to navigate, especially with certain professors I had previous relationships with. Like they still emphasize that I would have to call them professor something. And I couldn't call them by their first name, even though I felt like I was supposed to be their equal. So Are I think that serious? was also they said that? a challenge. It was subtle, I would say, but there are definitely moments where I felt like I had to be respectful <coughs> of their position. So also, I think what was huge was understanding the inner workings of higher education. So that also means just like the politics of the bureaucracy and knowing like, OK, what is the history of people's relationships with each other, whether it's faculty or staff, or, oh, this department did this to this department, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> or, like, oh, like, you know, what are, what are the stereotypes of, that people have of, like, from a staff perspective to, like, a student perspective, like, oh, those students, like, can't wait till summer is here, so they're gone, and this campus is quiet, you know, like, being able to appreciate that, but also knowing just how, like, an institution works and knowing, I think very much from a small school perspective, I've been told that it's very different in a bigger institution how um, the inner workings work. Because I think for us, it was very flexible and it was sometimes so flexible that it felt like we didn't know what to do with ourselves and we didn't know how to navigate. And we had to bring in very much and value our own kind of skills and why we wanted this job. So for me, I knew that I really liked um, 
working with faculty because I was a student consultant um, in undergrad. And so we would, I would go into classrooms and I would just sit and listen to a lecture and then give feedback to the professor on how to make their pedagogy better. And so through that, that's why I was interested in the position. So I was able to kind of create more workshops and about like universal design or something for learning and um, use th those skills in this um, job, even though that wasn't necessarily part of the job description. So I think that was valuable, was valuing and exploring my interest within a field um, because it's so broad. And I think some of the other silver linings is that because of the flexibility, I was able to also take a lot of leadership on a lot of projects and um, take a lot of initiative in terms of like suggesting things. Because before, our supervisor was a one person like team and she had then gained five other people. And so I think <coughs> figuring out how to work that, like we were able to really do that collaboratively and also being able to be creative and innovative and um, in a unstructured <laughs> way at times, but also it was really positive. <coughs> so I will talk about the future. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just putting them all up. Okay, so you've heard us talk about the skills that we've gained in our various positions, such as project management, collaboration, uh, delegation, and the hard technical skills. Um, so, I mean, I'm just sort of summing that up that it is really valuable that we gain all these skills. I mean, um, and just putting all that stuff on a resume or um, just saying to people, like, hey, I know how to do some coding now. Um, it's really helped um, sort of propel us into our next steps because I, I'm not sure how long the grant runs at the five colleges, but for Esther and I, um, the grant is was three years, so we're in the second year right now. Um, and so we, I mean, it was intended not, we're not to, supposed to be here forever, so we're supposed to be thinking of the next steps. So I think this position has really allowed me um, to think more clearly about what I want to do in the future, and it's just really given me that foundation of, like Esther was saying, working in higher ed, like navigating those politics and the, um, the structures. And so um, I'm going on to uh, graduate school for library science and history in the fall. And um, when I, I got a fellowship there, and the person I interviewed with, she was like, wow, you know how to do Moodle? Like, that's great. We don't have anyone who knows how to do that. And I was like, oh. Yeah, so it's so easy. It's Google, whatever. I do that all the time. Um, but so I mean, I think these are just really unique positions, and I think w what our thinking was. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. <laughs> in sort of having this was sort of to give an idea to people who are thinking about maybe applying for a grant to get post back positions, or how they might use this model in their own institution. And I think we're here to say that it's a really good idea. Um, but the reason we went through, you know, the positives and what we've learned, but also the challenges, is because I think there is a lot of planning that needs to be done before you sort of hire these post facts and just hire them to do, like Esther, for our job descriptions were rather vague. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I mean, it's hard from the hiring end because you don't know what people are going to want to do. Um, what your faculty members are going to want to do. So I think, you know, it just requires just a, a good plan um, for, and the sort of, and then thinking about sustainability, because again, like I said, we're not going to be here forever. So um, I know something that we've been doing is just keeping, you know, really well documentation of what we've done and sort of the steps and like planning this conference. Like, I'm not going to be doing that next year. So, <laughs> um, like, just having that all written out for people, you know, when they come to fill your role so they know what they're doing. Um, but also, and this, a similar educational technology position was created because it was sort of seen that this is a really important job to have, sort of as supporting um, faculty and staff members in their blended learning projects. So, um, but yeah, the question of sustainability, I mean, that's a big question throughout blended learning and all these digital projects and sort of how do you curate them, how do you not reinvent the wheel, that kind of thing. So, 
uh, that's what we're thinking about in terms of post back. Do we? Do you have a question already? I thought we were. Are we moving into the question phase yet? Yes, yeah. we can go. Oh, that's so then I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> For the whole group back here, uh, what what would a good plan look like? Uh, you know, and I think that's uh, that's that's one question. Uh, and uh, another would be, how did you get to be a post back? Uh, and and what might be uh, uh, a pipeline? that would produce more of you, mm. uh, so that uh, one could imagine a four-year right, college right. experience that would be productive of uh, at least a few folk mm. who really wanted to move into a post back situation like this, and who could then become post backs and maybe even eventually senior post backs mm. who might stay on an extra year and help train others yeah. coming up. So I, I, you know, those are two kind of related questions of how people want to start. Yeah, what would a good plan look like, and, <laughs> and uh, are there? Can you think about your own experience around the question of uh, sustainability over, mm -hmm. over a couple of generations? Yeah. Um, Thanks, Ab. Um, those are really excellent questions, and I think the first, um, well, I'll, how I got here. I've always been a weird like library tech nerd. So <laughs> um, like the in my a history class sophomore year, a digital project was offered. I was like the only one who was like, I want to do that. It was an Omeka exhibit. Um, so <coughs> I guess um, so I sort of when I saw this job description and it was, you know, listed all the different things, it sort of put together a lot of my interests because I've been interested in photography and film editing and making and then uh, sort of this digital storytelling stuff like that um, but in order to create a pipeline I think what at least we've been able to do with ETS educational technology services is that we have summer internships mm -hmm. and then we also have we're able to have a student worker during the school year so actually um, one of our workers she was an intern over the summer and then we had her back um, to be a worker during the semester the year, and now she's like the senior intern this summer. So that's sort of exactly the model you're talking about. I think getting people initially interested in that, that's definitely, you know, like how do you, the outreach, I guess, is hard. Um, so yeah, I, I might be able to like just sort of add to yeah. that. I think um, in, so, in some ways it might be useful to think about leveraging like the connections whoever's like making this plan um, already has. So uh, uh, by that I mean, you know, if you if you have faculty or you have staff connections, finding ways to like you're saying like you worked if you worked like you were in the library, like you're saying that like, you mm -hmm. did you actually worked in the library. Yes, I did. Um, yeah, so I had like similar a similar experience where I was working, um, I had a number of different fellowship, I had a fellowship and an internship at the library and that was really like it was something that I was already interested in. Like that was also like working with technology, working in this academic setting was something that I was already interested in. Um, and you know, and one thing leads to another. But I feel like you know, in terms of generating the interest, you know, there are people who are, without even realizing, in, interested in in working with technology and working in this academic setting. Um, and I think finding a way to tap into the, the, more or less the people who are, they're already working with um, might be an interesting way to start setting some of that up. And in terms of coming up with a plan for the actual year or so of a post specs job, um, I think while the job description, the vague job descriptions have definitely been a pattern, I think, in all of our positions, <laughs> the job description is less important It's what happens once you're in the position. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that, and I think you can attest this, probably all of us, that there was a lot of dull time where we came in with these expectations and for whatever reason weren't able to make Connections, struggle to find our place at the table. Um, we're not given tasks, which could be for a lot of reasons. I mean, you come in in the summer and it's yeah. kind of more of a dull time at the office anyway, but also if it's the first year of a grant, as it was for my case, you don't really know where it's going. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for a supervisor or an employer, who, whoever is coming up with the postback position, coming up with really concrete things to fill those gaps. It could even be letting the postback 
come up with their own projects. Mm -hmm. But I think, and then leave it up to them, you know? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be do this, this, and this. It could even be tell them to do administrative tasks. Mm -hmm. I think for me, what was very challenging was having a, um, a specific idea in mind of what the position was and then being told to do the administrative stuff. Kind of sit here and wait for projects to come. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can tackle that before the position mm -hmm. even begins and outline certain things, um, to give them stuff to do that's fulfilling that they can take agency over and they can call their own, I think it is a really good type of plan to have when they first start. I think also, in terms of advertising, there's that different kind of departments that you could also tap. So for us, we kind of thought about ed going through education department to um, ask for post -backs. Also, like people who are interested in higher education, people who are, in, who are more like Coding, computer science, people. Um, what are the other fields? I think those are kind of the main fields, and then people who are into well, like library special collections. I think those are the main avenues, and then something else. Did anyone ask any questions on the thing? Are you, I guess I asked some, but you already answered kind of. But one of my questions is about mentoring. I mean, mm -hmm. it sounds like you didn't have a lot of mentoring. <laughs> mentoring. What would mentoring look like? I guess, or what do you mean by mentoring? Well, like, um, um, a mentor would be someone who's kind of leading you and guiding you through the process, right? And so it can be a boss, or it could be, like, we have, a, well, where I used to work, we had a post back position, but it was tied to a faculty member, like mm -hmm. a specific mm -hmm. faculty member mm -hmm. or a department, you know? Mm -hmm. But it sounds like, and I don't know, I wasn't here the first five minutes, I think, so I'll maybe explain that. But if you were tied to a grant or something, but not to like a specific person, then I can see where mm -hmm. things kind of fall through the cracks, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe just a question of managing, <coughs> managing the, the um, but mentoring can just make you feel like you belong more, you know? Absolutely. That's the idea, is like, not just the management, but just um, providing, like, a sounding board. But it sounds like you guys kind of did that for yourselves in some way. Like, I don't know, you were like a poor cohort amongst yourselves, which is <laughs> nice. But, um, you know, someone who's probably a faculty member who's there just to kind of hear what you're saying and resolve any problems that you're having or help you reflect about on things. Because it sounds like it's a learning experience, not, not just a job, right? And so the learning of reflecting part seems like you did it kind of on your own, but maybe having that be a part of things where every yeah. month you're meeting with someone and saying, hey, how's it going? What can we do better? And, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like thinking about like put, putting some putting a post-back model into into action, I think that that like, reflection piece is like mm -hmm. a really important part of it. You know, because again, like we're like you're saying, like, we're not tied. I think for the most part, we're really not tied to like one specific you know, faculty member, or, like one mm -hmm. you know, narrow thing. We're working in a variety of different areas and a variety of different capacities in a way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even so on a smaller scale, but then on a larger, on a, on a bigger picture sort of thing, finding a way to like take stock and just like come up for air and like what. What, what just happened, like where can we, like what, what does this sort of mean, like what can I, you know, take away, sort of just assess the, the experience and, mm -hmm. yeah, start to uh, see how we can leverage that moving forward. Um, yeah. Another thing I think is, as you said, we've kind of had to carve our own path, which mm -hmm. has been really helpful and I think we've gained a lot of skills that we might not otherwise mm -hmm. if our hands have been held. Mm -hmm. But I do think that's something, that being invited to the table, mm -hmm. metaphorically, but also mm -hmm. literally, mm -hmm. um, and being introduced from day one, mm -hmm. which was not something that happened for my grant, it's something that I've told my supervisor and others that needs to happen and it's, changes are being made for sure. Again, mm -hmm. a learning experience for everyone. Mm -hmm. But I think being very explicit and this is what the post, because I've never heard of the word post back before, I had no mm -hmm. idea. I'm still, you know, finding myself on my resume you know, it's a family explaining <laughs> what it is. Um, so I think having someone explain what the position is and then mm -hmm. who I am, what I'd be doing, or, or letting myself do that, I think an email to all the faculty, staff that you may be working mm -hmm. with, also in person, you know, mm -hmm. and I was um, invited to meetings at the beginning of the summer, which was a really good jumping off point, but again, had to backtrack and explain why I had been invited in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I think something as simple as opening the door uh, for an introduction. Um, you know, virtually, but also in person, like facilitating the meeting of 
you know, Mary, we might be getting <coughs> this upcoming year, why don't you get together in the summer in the, in the downtime mm -hmm. is something that could really benefit a post-grad mm -hmm. and would ease the transition, I think. Mm -hmm. In addition to the, sorry. No, you go first. In addition to the title, or just commenting on the title, I think the title of the job is really important mm -hmm. because for a while, Esther and I were called Mellon Digital Curriculum Assistant. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. I still don't know. Yeah. You know, like, and so even though we were introduced to the community, no one knew what that meant. You know, so they had all their own names for us eventually. But now we are officially called like the post back Educational Technologist, and that's very clear what that is. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good point to make about you know what your title is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also hire more than one. I yeah. think that co this cohort style is really yeah. helpful like I having agree. the support and having people to navigate this process with was so helpful mm -hmm. and that was sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I uh, first it sounds like you've done great things and you've had great experiences and that's really gratifying to hear. I, I teach at a small college in Iowa um, and over the past two years I've hired uh, five post-baccalaureate fellows mm -hmm. who have worked closely with them. The question of mentoring is something that I've taken very seriously because the role that they have, while there's some technology dimensions, it's primarily a mentoring role that they're fulfilling. Mm -hmm. So I have to model that for them, both in terms of me being a mentor to them mm -hmm. and showing them how do you mentor students in a way that develops their independence, because mm -hmm. that's really our goal. Mm -hmm. um, I've also been at R1 universities, and I know what a postdoctoral fellow is like, and I know that part of the goal there is transition into a professional career. And I've, I've struggled with this a little bit with my post-baccalaureate fellows in that I have the sense that this should play a similar role for them, but the next steps are not so clear. And it's not so clear that I have the expertise to really be able to facilitate that. So my questions are, are twofold, maybe threefold. Um, have you had that be an experience for you, that people have been looking out for your career options? I certainly have written a lot of letters of recommendation or been, you know, answered some things, but. But beyond that, not done a lot. Would it be helpful for your career development offices on your own campuses to take a more direct interest in this and say, oh yes, this is a continuing part of our responsibilities to you. And finally, is the career part an important element in your decision to take the position in the first place? There, did I confuse you all? No, those are your questions. Those are awesome Thanks questions. for all thinking. Um, I think that this has been something that I have worked with throughout this year as a supervisor. Uh, this is the first year that we were in a position and is advertised, rightfully so, I think as a professional development opportunity. Um, but then there seem to be gaps in that. And so what we what we um, kind of concluded by the end, and I'm going on I think month 11 at this point, is my, uh, my supervisor encourages me to go out and meet people both within on work, on work time too and in a work setting. So, you know, go out for lunch or get a coffee, go to someone's office. Um, she encourages me to email people explicitly to uh, for the informational interviews or whatever. That we are, as, as we said in the presentation, we are kind of still students and we're still learning, very young. So I think there's a lot to be said for informally meeting with that and like that. So I have on in my lunch breaks, on my work time, been encouraged to go out, email people, meet people, and I think getting rid of any guilt that might be associated with leaving the office and making those connections is important in a post-bac position. Explicitly outline that both in the job description and in any onboarding orientation process. We encourage you to go out, even if it's not explicitly related to your field, let's say, you know, I want to go into science or whatever, and I'm in this language position. You know, meet with people, meet with professors, whatever, go out and do that on your time. It would be ideal if you could then bring that information back. But even still, this is a unique staff position in that it's kind of a student, you know, we're trying to figure out what we want to do. So I think encouraging those lunches and coffees and informational interviews on work time is really important. I also think um, allowing the employees, if possible, the postbacks to go and attend workshops. Um, I've been able to do a lot of different types of diversity workshops that is a you know, professional, academic, and personal interest to me. Inclusion in the workplace, d difficult dialogues, bringing that knowledge back to, to my office, but also just for professional development and personal growth within myself and being allowed to do that on work time. I think I keep stressing on work time because it's really important to prioritize this growth and development 
uh, within this position. And of course, if you say, feel free to do it at five o'clock, it's, you know, it sends a different message, I think. So allowing the pushback to maybe t take more opportunities that other employees um, in the office might not be able to changes the nature of their position a little bit. Yeah, so um, one of the great things is not having a set structure and having this flexible type of position is that we're able to have collaborations not only within the department but with other departments on campus. So Esther and I have been working with, oh, and Elizabeth too, sorry. Because <laughs> I was thinking about um, We've been working with different departments on campus. And um, so one of the programs is Life After Bryn Mawr. And so because we are recent grads, um, there's been um, the senior class um, this year requested advice on life after Bryn Mawr. So like how to find housing, um, what to wear at the job place, all the budget. how to budget, all of that. So we use our positions to benefit them and um, advise them and mentor them. Um, what else we can? And then we also, um, similar to Miriam, we were able to <coughs> develop workshops that we were able to premiere at other um, national conferences around diversity, inclusion, and equity as well, because that's something that we're really passionate about. And it's cool because the way, the more that you encourage it, because it's professional development, actually benefits your office. Because yeah. I think educational technology is about building relationships, and the more networks that you have, the easier it is to help people, whether it's students or faculty. So the more faculty that I interact with, or even staff, I can talk them into integrating technology more into their classroom experience and in a very seamless and also tailored way. And then also the more relationships that we also have with students and interacting with them helps us, um, helps them, I think, feel comfortable asking us for help. And I think that's also a huge barrier for so many students and having that perspective really gives them the ability to say like, oh, okay, this person's cool, I'm gonna ask them for, like instead of going to like my professor's office hours, like they feel more comfortable asking us for help in terms of their final projects and things like that. I would, I would sorry, I would, I would cover a lot, but uh, I would say that um, thinking about your question of, of, of uh, mentoring um, sort of ties back to what you were saying about um, thinking about uh, the questions of like reflection or finding finding ways to, to think about reflection. Um, I mean, some of us have talked about like what we're what we're doing next, but, but I think the a, a major takeaway for, for me from this experience was just that if I we've we've all done like a lot of different things, and I think the challenge is, is remembering and keeping track of all of it, and then being able to articulate that and value what those differences are. Mm -hmm. And I think you know. If you're able, like, if as a mentor, as someone who would be working with postbacks, being able to to facilitate that or be like a primer for them could be really valuable. You know, in terms of thinking about, you know, there isn't a, a one to one relationship. What your next step is going to be, you know, like we're all going on to a variety of different things. But if you're able to have that conversation uh, around, like, what are the skills that you've developed? What are your interests? What's changed from the beginning to now? Then I think that that ultimately is like a really valuable conversation and, and dynamic for uh, a mentor, uh, mentee. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, what skills do you need now that we can help you develop yeah. Yeah. for your yeah, future right. decision? So like, hey, you want to learn Adobe Premiere or the Adobe Creative Suite, like less creative <coughs> projects so that you can yeah. do that and learn those skills. Right. right now, I'm um, learning how to code with R. Um, so we have a you know, I keep hearing people say, oh, learn how to code with R, R, and I had no idea what R is. And <laughs> now that I have the opportunity to learn that, I'm really excited, and I believe it's the future and all that. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> so it's exciting to have the opportunity. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> believe it or not, I think it's akin to S. Oh, my God. I love it. It's a statistical <laughs> cross. I mean, it's a statistical platform. Ah, uh, okay. So okay. many who has PSS and SAS and that kind Others. of stuff. It, it wasn't originally a SAS program, but it, the language is yes. used for SAS. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. I'm kind of curious, well, I'm curious about um, <laughs> whether what we're engaged in is, is a process by which we're moving faculty across the threshold, faculty and students across the threshold, and so this is a kind of a transitional period or whether 
we really have a sort of a more of a permanent thing going forward in which it's going to be a collaboration between faculty and staff in curricular development in, in that as I think about every time I would be redesigning my course, this has been true for me for several number of years. I go and I have staff in lists or staff who are working with me. And from that standpoint, having uh, postbacks is great because you have that nice combination of the student piece in, in, in helping me design the course and the expertise in designing the course. But that's an important distinction, I think, to make as we think about how we're going to fund this. Because you all mentioned about one of your goals was to help some of us think about getting similar sorts of grants. But grants aren't the answer, right? Well, what's the purpose of the grant? I mean, if, if the grant is viewed as, oh, we're going to go through this transition period in which all faculty are going to be transformed into mm -hmm. this, and your positions go away because it becomes a solo faculty task, or we're moving into a world in which, no, it's going to be sort of a permanent thing in which we have a collaboration. We have to figure out how to sort of make that work with some senior e uh, EPS people and some postbacs who are doing it. Um, if it's that second model in which it becomes permanent, then maybe not so much your responsibility, but you need to help in the task of convincing the institution that it needs to now be a permanent part of the budget and what gets taken out of yeah. the budget to, to pay for this. This is a very long way to think mm -hmm. about to a question of, in your projects that you have done, have most of them been helping faculty make a transition to a new world or have most of them been really sort of collaborations in which a faculty member is going through maybe a periodic revision in a class or adding things in which you see it as more of a serial uh, set of collaborations that need to be done in curriculum. Well. I, think it, I think it's all of that. I mean, yeah. I, 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 think, I, think it, I think it's really like varied. I know, I know for me, there are some faculty that have, you know, are making a transition from being, you know, I, just exploring blended learning and start and getting started with this. But I mean, we've seen with our with my particular uh, blended learning grant, like we've seen like repeat offenders. You know, like people who have like done you know multiple applications, multiple rounds of applications, and it seems like that's not you know it's been an introduction that you know isn't you know it's not going away. Um, but yeah, I don't know if other folks have thoughts on. Well, I would say the model would be. Um, a, co a permanent collaboration model where, because technology is always changing, you're always going to need that person who is up to date with technology and is able to work with professors and, and have that collaboration permanently. So I would. And I also encourage like staff, like staff members to, to sort of get involved. Like I know with the course that I, um, uh, that I mentioned uh, during, during my part of the presentation, the, they had, they obviously like had, they're very busy like in, in general, like they have a lot of things going on and that's always going to be the case and I feel like in, in that particular instance, like there was a clear need, like she was very, you know, appreciative of someone being able to like step, step in and take on, you know, not just being the video editor, but also someone who's able to be part of these larger conversations and I think that, you know, if, if it becomes the sort of thing where, you know, staff are, you know, full-time staff, not postbacks, are, are are also seeing the value in this, and there's something that you know they could really stay in the game long term. Um, then I think that that would really speak to it, become like warranting a, a more permanent uh, consideration. One thing that MIT just came out with, and I think it's a new job description that they're hiring from, is the idea of learning engineers, which is kind of a pseudo position from what we do plus digital humanities. It kind of sounds like, but specific for more specific. So it would be someone who can do the tech part and also the education and be kind of like a TA for the professor in a multi, kind of, yeah, a more holistic model. Because for now, I think Elizabeth and I have really found that we are basically their digital TAs for a class. From start to finish, we're kind of with them in collaboration all the way. But then faculty still find that there's so much extra work in terms of grading and all that stuff that we maybe not, don't have the skills or we, it's like a, I studied, social science and it was a science class, I can't actually help you grade or anything like that. So it's that kind of pseudo position of. 
I think as Chris said, there's always a, there will always be a need. First, there's a need because people are always overworked and could have <laughs> people to pick up the slack. But I also think, I mean, my father is an English professor and he's been teaching for over 30 years and he's tried to experiment with blogs and different things. And he says, you know, I just wish I had someone who could kind of mentor me, you know, a young person who could kind of work me, work through this with me and that was their job. And I've tried to help him very informally, obviously, when I can, but I think that there will always be a need for faculty members um, who might be, you know, a couple years out of the game at this point to to be mentored. It really is a, a reciprocal relationship. We are learning a lot, but I think the faculty members are gaining a lot, which is why I, I think the postgrad position, particularly at five colleges, is so interesting. That and I think for all of us, that we we change because you know in three four years my experience won't be relevant anymore, and there will be someone who's younger and who knows even more stuff beyond Moodle and the stuff that I that I did for the four years at UMass. So I think there is a lot of um, benefit to, to having a sustained position. I just wanted to say something that's kind of that's, uh, slightly different, but it goes back to networks <coughs> and uh, connections. And I think it's really, like, we didn't, the Bryn Mawr group did not know the five colleges post back positions existed until they submitted a, a proposal. So I think it would be cool, I don't know how this would happen, but if like all the post backs of small liberal arts schools, you know, could be connected somehow. Um, just go to the conference. <laughs> 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 or like, I don't know, like maybe the East Coast schools or something like that. Um, just because, you know, I didn't, I was like, oh, there's someone else like us out there, you know? Um, we're not just this weird anomaly. So, uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I mean, to answer your mentor question, I think at the end of the day, like, we're our best mentors, right? So, like, Chris came five months before me, and he gave me all the information I needed to know in ways that maybe my supervisor might not might not have been able to because she didn't have, you know, as on the ground knowledge of the yeah. position. So, I think having, I think this year, the first years are always the hardest, but we've set hopefully a good precedent. You keep good records, you maintain connection even when you've gone with the post back, and that's how it's sustainable, and, and the mentors are from within. Yeah. Be good to go to set. I mean, these are obvious like things that teachers do, but whoever's in charge of them to figure out what your goals are, right? Like mm -hmm. one year, what do you want to achieve? Yeah. And you could be, you could take ownership of those goals and say, oh yeah, I like those goals. How would you try these goals too? Mm -hmm. Or something. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of that. I mean. The, you know, we, we set up these goals, but I think I think the idea, and that really seemed out of part, comes to the moment where what I'm doing or like what I'm interested in is able to like inch you know other people's stuff along. And I think that, that you know setting up or having that symbiotic relationship is its own value added for you know, everybody. I have a question. Um, so Chris, you uh, talked I think in <coughs> nice detail about taking ownership and the growth um, and education opportunity that's, I think, supposed to be part of the position that you got out of that. If you want to do another one, or could somebody else talk about a specific time when you did get to get some of you know, the good stuff that we're hoping to encourage in these positions? Um, you know, what did that look like? How did it play out? Um, you know, the, the positive lessons learned. So you want us to talk about like a project we did, like, a, a, or, or I mean, whatever is meaningful to you, where you got that growth, um, oh. uh, growth opportunity in education, mm -hmm. or you know, combination of hard technical skills, mm -hmm. all the all the good stuff that you lined up. Like, what are those? Um, detailed. You know, what do those look like? Because mm -hmm. I know they're very idiosyncratic. <laughs> I think having a really great uh, relationship with the professor. So, like, one professor that we really enjoyed working for is Sean Duqua, and she's done really great. I think she's just really creative and being having we had investment I think in her class. So like believing in what she's teaching I think really helped make it a meaningful thing and it may also motivated me at least more to build relationships with the students and to like see their growth as well. Um, and yeah, I think I'm personally motivated by seeing growth and change, so I think that's what kind of really helped was um, being curious about different people's courses and that um, made me more Similar, I'm, uh, I've worked with a history professor last year, um, and I was a history major, and I'm going to school for history. I really love history, especially mm -hmm. digital history, and um, I think, I think it just the partnership of sort of, I mean, we started working on this class together over winter break, and didn't stop until even after finals were over, because we sort of had a debrief conversation. 
And having that was like one of my favorite moments of this job uh, was sort of seeing it through start to finish. Mm -hmm. I think a big part of it was she was one of my professors while I was a student, so she trusted me. I had, you know, she knew I wasn't, I, I was a history major, um, so I could help in some of the grading, not grading, but like content read over, just, you know, that kind of thing. And I could help students with their research, like where to actually go. Um, but yeah, I just think just being, like having that opportunity, I just learned so much about project management, about sort of how to express my ideas and opinions about the syllabus without being disrespectful to the professor who, you know, this was, she worked hard to develop the syllabus and sort of, I think we learned that with Shaman too, how to suggest changes and sort of frame it as you're coming from this student experience. Um, it was really, it was really cool. And um, yeah, what was that? <laughs> Does anyone have any final things they'd like to add? Comments they'd like to do? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Should we share what we're doing next? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I think uh, grad school, I'm going to Smyrna's College in Boston. So I actually recently started a new job working at Bay Path University at their online uh, women's college. Uh, the position is a course builder, so a pretty, you know, logical next step. You know, we're doing a lot of online work, uh, uh, but there are the courses that we're doing there. So. And I, as of today, just accepted a job offer um, at CIEE, which is, I think, the, the nation's oldest international education nonprofit. I'm moving to Los Angeles to work as a study abroad campus coordinator. Yeah. yeah, thank you. You heard it first. I just spoke to my parents. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm actually, I'm staying on for another year. Um, um, I'm going to keep doing more research. Hopefully, after the third year, I'm going to go to grad school for psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Jancy's position is actually different from ours. Because yeah, she's my so my position. So I'm a research assistant for blended learning, and why this position started was because the president of the college got a grant that kind of kicked off the blended learning initiative at Brigham and you know, at first she was provost, and now she's president, and she hasn't had time to write the paper of the grant. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's bas that's basically why my position was created. But um, it's expanded a lot. Um, I'm involved in research collection for the several grants that we have here at Bernard around the learning, and I've also been doing marketing research for the school. This question scares me, but I do. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about transitioning, and I'm thinking a lot about um, working more with directly with college students because I think the the relationships that I've built with students and being able to maintain and see them grow kind of as their informal mentor has been really meaningful. And then also definitely thinking more about education in a broad sense, so like workshopping, facilitating, um, yeah, alternative education design, and. I do feel really confident because I feel like I've gained so many hard skills, but I'm able to really articulate them and know how they play out. And it's not just like, a, oh, I know how to do this, but I know why I should be doing this mm -hmm. and what's important about it. Thank you for coming.